Welcome, everybody. I do have to say that Lisa has one of the more um, interesting titles for her talks uh, as in comparison to a few other recent uh, luncheon guests. Don't hate the player, uh, hate the game, internet game, social inequality, and racist talk is griefing. Uh, Lisa is the director of the Asian American Studies Program, um, a professor in the Institute of Communication Research and New Media's program, Media Studies Program, professor, professor of Asian American Studies, at the University of Illinois. So, um, welcome, Lisa. All right. Um, before I start, I want to thank the Berkman Center for inviting me. I really appreciate the hospitality, the place to show this work and get some feedback on it. I also want to thank Dana Boyd at um, Microsoft because I wrote this there just the other day. So I appreciate the support that they're they've given and the work they're doing in social media. So if you can't hear me. Um, let me know and I'll try and speak up. I'm doing the best I can to be louder. So who am I and what am I talking about? Um, I thought I was going to be talking about World of Warcraft, but instead I'm going to be talking about um, RaffleCon. I do have another piece on World of Warcraft with a similar title, Don't Hate the Player, Hate the Game, which is about some of the really egregiously anti-Chinese racist machinima that's to be found. Um, about gold farmers in particular. So if you're an MMO player, you know what this controversy is a little bit. Um, there's a lot of really over-the-top kind of racist media going around made by players about how gold farmers are Chinamen and how they need to be killed, right? Um, but I'm not going to talk about that because I've already written about that. And so I'm going to be talking about um, racism and representation in Twitter in particular. Um, how many of you went to RaffleCon? All right. So um, if you came a little early, you probably saw one of the slides I was showing here, which was, I'll just go forward then, which is it's from RaffleCon, right? So does anybody remember this in the Twitter feed at RaffleCon? No? OK, there were a bunch of these seven or eight tweets that came out basically looking like this, nigger, 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 fat, nigger, 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 right? Um, and I wanted to talk about that in particular, and why it is this happens, why it's permissible, and whether it's possible to separate racism within the culture of griefing, right, which is what this is, from the kind of generative, culturally productive side of griefing, which is also part of the culture of Anonymous and 4chan, right? So my research question is really, what are the ties between racism and cultural production in griefing as a culture, as shown by this, is it possible to find some way to separate the kind of rich vein of productivity which has given us things like lolcats, you know, um, things white people like, and so on? Uh, well, I'll exempt that, but the things that come out of 4chan say from this kind of behavior and what's at stake in us failing to do that. So that's what I'm trying to look at today. So um, I, I call my paper Don't Hate the Player, Hate the Game. Um, partly because I really like uh, Jamie Foxx, I think he's funny, <laughs> but also because it's really not my goal as a critic to start ragging on people for being racist, homophobic, xenophobic, and sexist online. That's kind of a bootless errand, right? It, it would just takes a long time to do that, and it, you don't really get a whole lot out of it. Um, blaming people for doing these behaviors is not what I'm trying to do. Instead, what I'm trying to talk about is how digital social platforms like the internet, cultures like griefing, create occasions in which racist discourse is strategic. Right? It accomplishes something. Um, and also, when racist discourse like this not only reflects the racist discourse we have in society, but the problems we have talking about race in everyday life. Right? Why is it that it goes here? But at RaffleCon, there was no conversation about this. Nothing in the Twitter stream took note of this at all. Um, if you were at RaffleCon say you'd seen these, these tweets, what would your reaction have been? I really want to know, like if, you, if you didn't see it, or say you had seen it, right, what do you think you would have thought, done, or said about it, or tweeted about it? Are you guys going to address that? Pardon? Are you guys going to address that? Or like use that as an example? Like if it was during the panel, right? Yeah, this did happen during the panel. Then that yeah. would be one of the tweets that I would have tweeted out. Like, really? Okay, yeah. Um, Christina, hi, <laughs> it's great to see you. Uh, there was a lot of that stuff both in Twitter and um, more in the back channel, and like I think as the people who were running it, our understanding was that just that was just people who weren't at the actual conference, the people who were, you know, because the link to a bunch of panels got sent out to me, and they were like, 
let's troll these motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. like, so that's right. That's what happened. And like, we understood that it wasn't people on the panel, so there was very little we could actually do about it at the conference. Right, right. You're in one of these tweets. I hope you don't mind that I put it up. Okay. <laughs> um, so, right. Absolutely. There's nothing you can do, right? Twitter's a public channel. That's what happens. Um, and I don't think anybody thought the people who did this were at the panel or at the event, right? I mean, it was just griefing, straight up griefing, right? And, and in fact, very traditional, uh, kind of uncreative griefing. And what was interesting about it is it didn't happen during the race panel, which is when you might expect it to. That was the panel that Christina um, put together and that I moderated. It happened during the keynote. And the reason is that it was about um, specifically moot right, the person who is probably best associated as the public face of 4chan, um, he was speaking and it was a way to, to get into that event, right, to kind of grief him and to grief the event generally. Um, two years ago when I didn't go, I heard there was boombox disruption. So we, everybody knew there's going to be something. And this is what there was. So, um, all right, so it's good to get the context. Any other responses? If you'd been there, what would have been your reaction, either mental or actual or networked? Or so was this running in the background, like during the panel? No, because uh, Backchan was used during the actual presentations, but people were basically looking at their phones too, I think. So I was following both Backchannel and Twitter. I think a lot of people were, right? Pretty heavily moderated, so people were voting down. Uh, right, right. Yeah, but Twitter was not. Yeah. Just sorry to um, back up a little bit, but not sorry, but the context of this presentation. What, what was it? You, you had asked initially who was there. I don't even know what. Okay, well, I'll start at the beginning then. That's a good, a good reminder. And griefing. Griefing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was a good, good call, <coughs> reminder for me to start. Okay. So, um, RafaCon is a conference that was held earlier this year, and it's about internet culture and memes, which is to say the popular culture that's produced virally often by anonymous people and then sometimes can be marketed or commoditized by groups like I can has cheeseburger, the cheeseburger network, right? So lolcats, everybody knows what lolcats are, right? It came out of this culture. And um, it's often spoken of in very positive terms. A moot who is the public face of 4chan recently gave a talk at TED which is the kind of hoi polloi fancy conference for people who are innovators in technology. Yeah. Just to clarify, you mean Christopher Poole? Poole? Yes, oh. that moot. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so I saw his talk at TED, and he really highlighted some of the almost philanthropic things that 4chan has accomplished, such as harassing the Scientologists pretty effectively, <laughs> um, using collective intelligence to prosecute someone who had abused a cat, um, which was remarkable. It was an awful case of cat abuse. Um, and producing this rich vein of culture, lol cats, you know, all these other kinds of, uh, you know, I can't think of any other ones right now, but there are lots of great cultural memes that have come out of 4chan. Um, what he does not talk about, however, is things like the patriotic nigras, which I'm going to be talking about here, and this, because this also came out of 4chan, right? So what I'm looking at is can we separate these two things? Is it possible? to admire the accomplishments of 4chan, to view them as innovators in some way, but also to call this out, right? So, um, as I said, the lack of places in the public sphere where race and racism can be honestly talked about and talked through has created a vacuum that the internet is filling, sometimes like this, um, particularly for young people. Um, the internet operates on an attention economy model, and the use of words like nigger functions as a form of currency that enables one to jump the attention queue, like it or not, right? Um, however, there are many other better ways to get attention online, and this one is troubling for a lot of reasons. It contributes to an atmosphere of incivility that's ultimately bad for online communities, for equality, and actually for internet businesses. So I'm going to go back. Oh, here's some books I wrote. Um, <laughs> so it's not a good ad for your game platform to be known like this. So this was a tweet that Christian Lander sent out, right, during the race conference, the race panel, which I thought was very apropos, that we know our platforms not only by what they cost and what content they have, but what forms of bigotry and racism they support. And so here it is, racism is for the internet, homophobia is for Xbox Live. And he's referring, obviously, to the promiscuous use of the word fag and Halo and, and all these kinds of games. And you know this is really a widespread thing when NPR, not the media leader when it comes to digital culture, 
air stories such as this one on Xbox 360's Modern Warfare 2. So I'm not going to show it just in the interest of time. I'll put it up and, you know, if you want the slide, you can look at it. This is a short story that points out how pervasive racism and sexism are, are in online games, specifically Modern Warfare. And it warns parents that they should be worrying less about game content and violence and probably more about what they're hearing from other players, right? This pervasive racism, sexism, and so on. And it mostly points out the total inability of game companies themselves to regulate it, right? That when it's reported, it's never acted on right away. People don't get much sense that there is much regulation at all. And if it's an unfriendly environment for women and gay people, there's nothing really that women and gay people can do about it, at least through the, these channels. But I think rather than despairing of online games as spaces that are just going to be racist and sexist no matter what, due to anonymity, what I'm trying to do is to see what specific forms this takes, why and how it operates promiscuously, what its history is, how it might be checked, and how its forms are themselves memes, right? Because racism is a meme. It works just like other memes do. Passed on from person to person, no formal kind of channel for it, and so on, sexism too. Racism both is and isn't a big deal in virtual worlds and in games. The N-word is still the ultimate conversation stopper, hence its promiscuous use. Though in my time it's gone from a word you could say if you pronounced it right, nigga, not nigger, to one that cannot even be said at all or visually reproduced. I was talking to David the other night and he, we and I, you and I could say it, I think, because we're of a different time, where we, you know? Um, but since then, it's become a euphemism. I was looking at the iBook version of Conrad's novella, The Nigger of the Narcissus, and they had reprinted it as the N-word of the Narcissus. However, Penguin and Dover still issue paper editions of the book that use the word, right? So clearly the word is absolutely toxic, very, very problematic. Um, so, but while well, it's used really commonly in online games and discourse, it's less as a form of straightforward racism, right, and more as a part of the culture of griefing. And this is how people play it off, like, oh, it's not really racism, it's just griefing, I'm just trying to bother you. Um, griefing has been around as long as the internet has been around, I think that's pretty safe to say. Um, the first few emails were probably trolls, I imagine. Um, these and other social irritants have become part of the culture of online worlds at the same time that our culture as a whole is undergoing a huge shift as to what racism is and what it means. And so I'm gesturing towards post-racial post society here, right? Um, the thinking that now we have Obama as president, we no longer have a race problem. It's no accident that these are happening at the same time. For griefing is about mocking those who take the internet too seriously, that's what it is, right? Shouting the N-word at a conference about memes. The current racial formation works in the exact same way by making fun of people who take race too seriously, right? People who call it out. The paradox of online racism can be summed up as follows. We are currently in a moment of what I'm calling enlightened racism, a term I'm taking from Susan Douglas's book, Enlightened Sexism, which is a really good book, just came out in 2010. Enlightened sexism is, according to her, quote, a response, deliberate or not, to the perceived threat of a new gender regime. It insists that women have made plenty of progress because of feminism. Indeed, full equality has allegedly been achieved. So now it's okay, even amusing, to resurrect sexist stereotypes of girls and women. So he talks about pussycat dolls and you know, the swan and these kinds of really egregiously kind of retrograde entertainment. As Douglas writes, quote, enlightened sexism takes the gains of the women's movement as a given and then uses them as permission to resurrect retrograde images of girls and women as sex objects, bimbos and hoochie mamas still defined by their appearance and biological destiny, end quote. So she says this works precisely because women have made significant gains in the last few decades. As she writes about this overtly sexist television programming, I'm just discussing, quote, on The Man Show, for example, does anybody ever watch The Man Show? Right, is it still on? Really? No, I, I didn't think so. Okay, <laughs> so on The Man Show, and it was really egregious, right? Um, she writes, it was understood that it is sexist and ridiculous to have bikini-clad women jumping on trampolines, and furthermore, the guys who wanted them to do this were morons. Therefore, the objectification of women is now fine, Why it's actually a joke on the guys. It's silly to be sexist, therefore it's funny to be sexist. And we all know that funny is the real currency of the popular internet. Enlightened racism is a form of racist behavior and speech only available to those who are known or assumed known not to be racist. You're the only ones who can do it. This is why it's okay for media products like the film Tropic Thunder. Did anyone see this film? Okay. Television programs like South Park and The Office and the humor of Sarah Silverman 
to contain or at times be based on overt racism and sexism. For as Mary Beltran writes, this lets them both, quote, skewer and it sometimes appear nostalgic for ethnic and racial stereotypes. I always feel a little weird when I watch Mad Men, honestly. You know, I feel like it's, it's also kind of resurrecting that nostalgia. This is characteristic of what she calls post-racial humor, and it's important that it's humor that gets to use race this way. You don't see other genres doing this, right? Um, because they would just be racist. There would be no backing up from that. Um, as I mentioned before, humor is a social capital of online interaction, especially social games, right? This is the way you make friends, the way you become well-known, well-liked, is by being funny. However, post-racial humor is a confusing discursive mode for young people who are sometimes unable to separate enlightened racism from regular racism. So paradoxically, the worse the racism and, the sexism, and racism and sexism are, the more extreme and cartoonish it is, the harder it is to take seriously and the harder it is to call it out. Um, indeed, as scholar Rosalind Gill puts it, quote, the extremeness of the sexism is evidence that there's no sexism, right? The man show isn't sexist because it's so sexist, it can't possibly be serious. If there is no more sexism, then there's no need for sexual politics, social movements, and sexual politics can be mocked and attacked. So, the N-word is funny because it is so extreme that nobody could really mean it, right? And humor is all about not meaning it. So if you take humor plus the N-word, you get enlightened racism online and attention. So I wanted to show you some of the Twitter stream here. Um, and this happened as during the plenary when Moot was talking, so I tried to highlight some of this for you. And there's some funny things to be seen here, right? You have tweets about China kind of coexisting with this. Here's another one, Bill Wagoner, another meme, right? Um, I think it's kind of funny to see this, how much more grounded, thoughtful, clear some of the repeat panelists are two years later than nigger, 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 right? <laughs> um, this one, anontalk.com owns you. So here's claiming of the N-word, right? It's a raid, a non-talk. Um, and here is the announcement of the intention, what this is, raid, nigger, nigger. Um, however, okay, so the use of the N-word, the reference to raid into a non-talk made it clear the attack came from 4chan members, not people at the conference necessarily, but it was not taken seriously at the conference, no one responded to it in tweets, no one talked about it at the conference, because it was clear that they are not racist, right? It was so over the top, it was clear it was not racist. It was about griefing. There were several African Americans at this conference, including at that plen plenary session, Kenyatta Cheese was on the plenary, he's a black guy, yet it didn't come up at all right? Um, because this was enlightened racism, used for humor, and there's nothing more to say about it. However, there was one lone tweet regarding racism on the Twitter stream, well, not about this, but about something relating to one of the moderators. It's actually about sexism. So this person wrote, that, that woman, which was Christina, sitting on the plenary panel, belongs in kitchen, not talking to Moot. Fuck her. <laughs> then a day later, somebody responds, Yes, and then you get little twerps like I am Kana who think they are so cool repeating the misogyny and racism they see on 4chan. So this was drawing a connection between the nigger, nigger, nigger raid and then the attack on Christina and then, you know, kind of all bringing it back to 4chan is the place where this had come from. <laughs> so this is a different spin on 4chan than one sees in the world of internet culture, which is over overwhelmingly pretty approving of 4chan. As I said, Moot's been a featured guest on TED describing the political actions of 4chan and the use of collective intelligence. Um, racist raids like this one are ported over from the cultural virtual world raids led by a 4chan group who call themselves the Patriotic Negras. So let me see if I can get this to work. Has anybody heard of this? Oops, what happened? All right, let me roll it back a little so you can see their little banner. This is called Patriotic Negras Hello Fur Fags, and it's a uh, um, capture of an attack upon a place called Rainbow Tiger, which is a popular bar in Second Life, frequented by furries. Who? Anybody want to explain what furries are? I don't want to go there. Can somebody do it? Okay. That's a good explanation. So, this is about how you can use code, basically to try and ruin somebody's second life experience. So there are lots of social videos like this from this group that say ruining your sin. And here they're ruining it. They're filling it with these meaningless boxes and screwing up the social space. 
for people who like to dress as animals online and sometimes have sex with each other, right? And um, so they're trolling, right? They're destroying their squeeze, they're, they're harshing their squeeze. Um, in an interview with Ten Zen Monkey, the pretty prominent blog, Mudkip's acronym, who's one of the spokespeople for patriotic niggers, told Luke Cabron that, quote, I'm not going to deny, I'm going to turn it down a little bit, Patriotic Negras is a troll group. We exist primarily to make people mad. Well, a few of us might be racist or something. Who knows what this group has completely irrelevant to the cause. N3X15, our web hoster guy and acting Second Life leader, is a Republican. I probably disagree with him on a lot of things. But we're willing to overlook that in the fact we all lie to the same goal. I think laughs transcend party lines. So, the lulls, right? The justification for why all this griefing occurs. So what is a 4chan raid? We just saw two, you know, one on the Twitter stream, one here in Second Life. And the Patriotic Nigra is a group of griefers who delight in breaking Second Life and also in blocking parts of Habba Hotel. This is partly maybe how you know them is they, they, they make these, these black avatars and stand in public places and block access to things. So Habba Hotel is another place where they've done this. Um, and they also fill places with garbage like Second Life are not African-American, right? I think it's pretty safe to say, um, but they resort to offenses, racist language, and behavior as a short, shortest route to the goal, which is the lulls, right? disrupting online community and social life for the lulls. So you skew people who take it too seriously, right? So the stated purpose of this group is to skewer those who take the internet too seriously. However, the deployment of the N-word in their name and also during their raids can, conflates taking racism seriously with inappropriate social investment in online worlds. That you are a big loser, right? Someone who wants to be in Second Life and thinks that you live there. Um, if you are that person, you're somebody who takes racism too seriously as well. So calling out that racism makes you a person who doesn't get it. Because griefing is supposed to be about the lulls, not race. As they say that all the time, we're not racist. So if you do not find it funny to see fur fags in online clubs have their space vandalized, and you don't think that the use of the N-word is lulls, then the problem is not with your politics, but with your sense of humor, right? So what's the problem with enlightened racism online? Um, enlightened racism online, be it in the form of these um, Twitter raids, racist speech, and MMOs. Um, in fact, there's an interesting essay by Tanner Higgin about Leroy Jenkins. You all probably know who Leroy Jenkins is a little bit, right? Can someone explain Leroy? For others who don't know what Leroy is, what he did. He was at RaffleCon too, actually. He was working security. <laughs> so I got his <laughs> autograph in my badge, which I thought was very interesting. He was famous for his actions in World of Warcraft, doing basically really dark things. And then there was a YouTube video which was made of this happening, and then he became famous. That's it in a nutshell. Yeah, right. And very famous. So famous that he, that Leroy Jenkins appeared in a couple commercials um, on television. Uh, Blizzard incorporated the title Jenkins for people who had accomplished certain goals in the game as an honorific. Um, he was at the first RaffleCon I know because Leroy Jenkins is one of the most viewed pieces of machinima from the game. It's very, very well known. Um, what people don't talk about so much is the role of Leroy Jenkins as a minstrel figure, right? Using this kind of black minstrel-like speech, using a black kind of minstrel-like name. Um, Tanner Higgins written an essay on this on games and culture, and it says, why is it that no one talks about this? Because it's the lulls, right? When it's the lulls, you, you can't talk about race, because that's not part of the lulls. You know, then you're out of the... Can someone jump in? Can we use our collective intelligence to fill in what these means are? How, how would Something you best describe the lulls? LOL is standing for laughing out loud. Mm -hmm. So it's been turned into laughs. Yeah. yeah, for laughs, right? The lulls. But very intimate specific. Right. L-U-L-Z is different than LOL. What's the difference? Um, well, LOL is, is sort of an expression, whereas the lulls is sort of this entity that people aspire to. <laughs> 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 Okay, so you could say if there's currency <laughs> in virtual world, the lulls is the currency. So it's not cash money, it's attention and the lulls. And the lulls is the way to get the attention, right? Um, and so a lot of these things I've been talking about are justified as for the lulls. They do get attention. Um, but they're also incredibly racist. 
So I'm trying to tease apart how is it that racism is, in, is imbricated in the lulls? Is it possible to pull it out of the lulls? What, what does it matter to us that our online culture, which we care about and call our culture at RaffleCon, is this way, right? Like, you know, why is it we can't even say anything about this in the Twitter stream? Well, if you do, then you don't get it, right? You're, you don't get it. You're not in the culture. So um, part of the problem is that it's difficult. OK, so when Blizzard appropriates the Leroy Jenkins meme, right, sells it back to us, it's our culture that's selling it back to us, they're legitimizing it, basically, right? Um, so this is part of the problem. The other is that it's very difficult to check this kind of racism or call it out even without flying into the face of internet popular culture itself. That is, the ultimate justification for any act is the lulls, that particular type of attention, which is especially prized and especially valuable, right? Um, LOL can be from anything. It can be sex in the city is LOL. But the lulls is truly an accomplishment. It's a creative act. It's unique in particular to a small group, but which has a possibility to be commoditized for the mainstream, which is what lolcats were, right? Um, as Ben Hu says, he has 40 employees, all getting paid. That's a lot. Um, so internet humor rules in the world of anonymous online communities like Twitter, 4chan, Modern Warfare 2, WoW, you know, any of these things, um, or any other youth-oriented social space. So critics of enlightened racism online, or enlightened sexism online, may find themselves cast in the ungrateful role of the buzzkill, or worse yet, the humorless oldster hopelessly noobish and not to be regarded as an authority on anything. And I think my most sad moment at RaffleCon was going up to buy a t-shirt from Ben. He said to me, have you heard of I Can Has Cheeseburger? I said, do I look that old? <laughs> <laughs> I bought a, a shirt, but I still felt like, oh God, like I've been totally made. So this makes it very difficult to do anything about enlightened racism online, because by protesting it, one becomes unqualified to protest it. Right? You're not in it, so you can't say anything about it. As Douglas writes about enlightened sexism, it is essential that feminism be repudiated as something young women should shun as old-fashioned, withered, humorless, repulsive. So women with long skirts, gray hair, you know what I'm talking about. Likewise, nobody at Ralph Khan called out the nigger raid, for everybody knew what it was and knew that outrage is the oxygen of grief for communities. So to have called it out, to give it any attention at all, is to provide it with the oxygen that it needs. Everybody there knows that that's how trolling works, right? So no one said anything. Sincerity and protest were rendered impossible by the cultural context of internet humor, which is how enlightened racism and sexism managed to survive and replicate. It's not cool to be a feminist, right? My students say, no, no, I'm not a feminist. Right? I want to make the same money as, as men do, but I'm not one of them. That's not cool. Uh, let me get back to my PowerPoint. Huh. Okay. So as games become more networked, English becomes a minority internet language after Chinese and other languages, and collaboration and social intelligence are more needed than ever in commercial and in everyday life. There is much at stake in our sorting out our problems with enlightened racism, online and offline. The problem is not so much its prevalence as its intractability, the difficulty of addressing it. It is in our own interest to make it clear to youth and others what racism is, what humor is, how to tell the difference, and most importantly, how to respect it. So I'm thinking of the hysterias around children on the internet. Is it harmful for naked pictures of teenage girls to be circulating on the internet? Sexting. So, you know, the Time, Time Magazine's freaking out about this. Is that harmful? Yeah, it's probably harmful. Is it harmful for a young person to be recorded in some way yelling, nigger, 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 or bitch, 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 or fag, 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 and have that available for all time, archived, you know, searchable, indexable. Yes, maybe it's more harmful, actually, in my opinion, than sexting, I think. I think that's very bad, and there's really no way for us to do anything about it currently. So I already went over the context of this, um, where it disappeared, which was at RaffleCon and so on. Um, so many undergrad students at my own campus, University of Illinois, are still unable and unwilling to give up their racist Indian mascot, Chief Alinawek. So do you know who Chief Alinawek is, right? Egregious, totally bad, gross. Um, because they view him as a symbol of respect for Indians. And despite what actual Indians have to say about this, we've actually had Native Americans come on campus and say, knock it off. This is not cool. We don't like it. We think it's dumb. Um, but the students don't really care. 
what these people, the Indians themselves, have to say, right? Because they know what they think respect is, and they are going to stick to their side of that, right? It's enlightened racism again in some ways, right? You can't take it, you can't, you're taking this too seriously, they tell the Indians who come to campus. Lighten up, right? Um, if network worlds, these uh, virtual publics, are where youth are learning how to be civil, are making the mistakes they need to make. And I think Sonia Livingstone makes an excellent point that youth need to make mistakes to learn, right? And she's concerned, as is Cory Doctorow, that there are very few public spaces for youth at all, right? Youth aren't allowed to go lots of places they went when I was young, so they go where there are public spaces to interact, which is to say the internet. That's where they are going, Modern Warfare 2, right? It's the mall of the present day in some ways. Um, this is where people learn to be civil, right? Um, and it's our responsibility to make sure they can learn from these mistakes in an idiom that makes some sense to them. So I think that Xbox Live banning them does not make sense to them in the idiom of the lulls, in the idiom of internet culture. They just see it as more asshattery, right, to use the, the idiom. It's just more asshattery, it's just more regulation, right? It's just another thing to get around. So that it's more, more stuff to be creative about avoiding. Um, this is a problem, right? How is it possible for you to tease apart enlightened racism from real racism from, and to learn about it, right? So I think a clip like the one I'm going to show might be helpful. Alternatively, a nice weekend spent with Cory Doctorow's novel For the Win, which I really recommend, written from the point of view of gold farmers. So I'm just going to show you a really short clip from a documentary about gold farmers where somebody who is a gold farmer talks to an interviewer saying what he feels about this. So this is what he has to say. Okay, so one person's lulls is another person's non-lulls, let me just say, right? Really serious thing. And so um, as we become more transnationalized, partly because of the internet, I think it's really more important than it ever has in some ways to think about how we can have interaction with people in other cultures, um, people who we may or may not view as inferior to us, um, how civility can be achieved in youth culture without totally alienating youth, right? And I speak as somebody who's in the crotch between the X and the Y generations. So I can, I can, I can kind of see the problem here, right? Which is that you can't really get youth to do anything unless you acknowledge their own cultural language, right? And, and how, is that, how is that gonna happen? So I'm done. Um, any comments, questions, very welcome, thanks. Do you know how much, or to what extent, this enlightened racism type humor occurs in non English speaking cultures? So, is there, uh, is there the equivalent of people jumping in and using the N word in Twitter streams in like, Chinese events? Or? You know, I don't read any other languages, but yeah, you have answered that. <laughs> there was a Berkman fellow, Johnny, uh, who just went back to Hong Kong. He was saying that in Shanghai, on a lot of the message boards, they have this one particular. So do you remember exactly what he had said? There's this one particular thing they used to insult non-Shanghainese, uh, and that's prevalent all over it. So it's not quite racist, but it's very... <laughs> Sorry? Something like that, yeah. Uh, oh, right. The abbreviation is hard drive, hard disk, because the original thing was banned. And it, there's, there's some complicated explanation for why that's insulting for non shanghainese but that's one example I have heard of in non-English languages. I don't have any empirical information on this. It would be hard to know, um, but I think it's pretty safe to say that griefing is transnational, <laughs> right? And that some version of it is wherever there are youth and internet, or probably anyone in internet, and that 4chan is also a transnational group of people, but not just Americans. So I would venture yes, but I don't, I don't know. Like I can't, I don't have any evidence about that. So yeah. Uh, I know that among Korean youth, there's kind of sort of a reverse griefing going on where they'll play in on American servers for MMOs and then tell people they're Korean children um, for the lulls, basically. So what are the lulls to be gained out of that? I'm curious about that. This, this annoying older people by being younger and better. 
Oh. Yeah. That is annoying. Yeah. <laughs> and they think it's hilarious. But that's what MMOs are. Yeah. I mean, from my experience, I play World of Warcraft. That's all it is for me, is constantly being around people who are younger and better than me. But, uh. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, outside of, outside of this environment, I'm thinking about um, sort of the average YouTube video and the, the strain of racist comments oh. that, that exist in, in most, I don't know about most, but a lot of videos on YouTube, and it doesn't seem to be the, the same form of enlightened racism that you're talking about. There seems to be a, diff, a slightly different phenomenon going on there because it, it, it's it's the the kinds of a uh, the kinds of responses they get isn't the same as the kind of griefing responses that you're talking about here so um and then i i also wonder if that kind of racism if, if that's different than than what you're talking about if that kind of racism racism actually creates a kind of ethical framework for youth when they view these youtube videos mm. if it's not something that that appears as like oh i i accept that but it, it provides a kind of counter narrative to what what should be there within those um, w within those YouTube comments, so it, it actually does create a um, so in that sense, racism actually for, racism in, in the sort of textual form it actually functions as a nice sort of um, backboard or a counterpoint to, to what they to sort of ethical thinking. That's a very insightful comment, and I'm glad you brought in the word ethical framework because that and YouTube never appear in the same sentence. <laughs> um, but I think it's just too easy to blow off YouTube comments, as you say, as over the top racism that aren't reflective of anyone's actual real thinking but are trolling, right? Partly because people do that on YouTube because they can't talk about race anywhere else, right? It feels too dangerous to do that. I think white people are terrified to talk about race, right? That it is, in fact, one of the most anxiety-producing things in American society to feel like you might get in some kind of argument or conversation with somebody or offend somebody in that way, which is partly what enlightened racism is about. In some ways, it's the only way people feel they can do it and they do it in such an over-the-top way that they almost don't even feel comfortable with it, probably themselves. I mean, I'm not speaking for white people here, right? But I do believe this is part of it. It's, it's in some ways the failure of multicultural education to help white people and other people talk about race in any kind of coherent or reasonable way. So I'm um, Christian Lander, who knows more about race than probably anybody in some ways, wrote, he said, or he tweeted, um, there's two kinds of people, okay, let me get to there, sorry about this. Oh, I didn't put up here. But he said, there's two kinds of people on the internet. White people and people who find white people annoying. <laughs> right? And that's, that's actually a very insightful thing to say. right? Because it, it really frames whiteness as not a desirable position in some respect. right? That white people are, are fearful all the time in some ways of being called out. And, and partly because of the behavior, yet the only place they can even talk about race is here. And the convention for doing it sucks. Right? You can't have a serious conversation about it, really, because somebody's going to troll you or, or come up with you know, some unreasonable response. So um, I don't want to talk, this is why I say don't hate the player, hate the game. Like I'm not saying these people are evil and bad and they should be banned at all. I'm saying they're a symptom of a situation we're in today where it's just impossible to have even a, a decent conversation about race um, with white people involved. Right. So I think the panel that I moderated about race called I Can Has Dream um, was partly about people who are doing race humor, but for people who within their own group. So um, there are two girls called uh, My Mom is a Fob, did I, My Mom is a Fob, which is all the hilarious things your Chinese grandmother says to you when she can't speak English very well, right? And there's a lot of those. We all know what they are. Um, and people often ask her, so can non-Chinese understand this and find it funny? Is it just for Asians? If people ask Baratunde Thurston, who was another panelist, can black people, people who aren't black, find Jack and Joe politics useful? Do they think it's funny? And Baratunde is funny to anyone. <laughs> like he's a stand-up comedian for his job. So he is very funny. And I think that's why the panel was so successful, is that he was so funny. But that's always the question, like, what is the place for whiteness in racial humor? You know, is there a place? What can it be? Can it be on the internet? And looking at these as kind of symptoms you know, it gets folded into the lulls, unfortunately. And the lulls have this other baggage around being over the top and, you know, not, not serious ever. So this is what's so frustrating is you can never really question this, this stuff to these people. They'll just blow you off, totally. Yeah, Alex. Um, 
So you introduced um, this kind of new, maybe even slightly innocent concept of racism. Um, but you never really made a, qualita a qualitative statement about which one, this new one, or the ordinary racism is uh, maybe better moving forward from today. Um, and, and, <laughs> and I mainly ask this because... Um, That's a good question, though. It really is. When we were working yeah. on Rafflecon, uh, we, we were always thinking about the mainstreamification of yeah. uh, internet culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I count this cheeseburger as a really interesting case because it's taking uh, a really subcultural media mm -hmm. and kind of selling it into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. But what you don't see um, in opposition to Wolcats, for example, uh, are things like Pedal Bear or Nigger Stole My Bike or mm -hmm. these really oh, wow. somewhat racist memes yeah. being sold off into the mainstream because they're yeah. entering out of that new innocent form of racism into the old ordinary sort of race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a good point, yeah. So there's a, the, you get both enlightened and, and regular, version 1.0 and version 2.0 racism, <laughs> mingled together. And you, you, as you say, they get pulled apart because you can sell 2.0 racism, but you can't sell 1.0 racism because no one wants that, right? It's kind of embarrassing. So it's not as if one succeeds the other. In fact, they kind of coexist at times. And it's the disreputable racism that's part of 4chan, like patriotic niggers, nigger, 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 that you can't sell. Like No one wants to buy that. It has another function. Um, but I think that question of which is better, like, I don't think either of them are good. <laughs> you know, I think that I think enlightened racism is very much a symptom, though, of a society that feels that racism isn't really a problem anymore, right? Which is why we can now talk this way. There's really no sense of sympathy or empathy anymore, I think, for people of color having it bad, because everyone's got a boss who's, who's a person of color, you know, someone kicked their ass once who's a person of color, and they just don't see color as being a big social problem anymore, or gender, I think. That's where this comes from. Yeah, Christine? Um, I'm curious whether you think this would change when the constituents of people determine what is normal to right? Like, because right now, it's funny to all become people, you know, black people with afros and, and fade away yeah. because yeah. they're all white, but right. like, at what point is it going to also be funny to be, like, a bunch of people who are blonde with pop collars, like, in the shade? You know, like, when is that going to be I think that's already funny. <laughs> great question. And you could say the lulls have always existed as long as there's been a white male majority, right? Frat humor is the lulls. Any kind of humor that you cannot call out as a non-member of that group is the lulls, I would say. It's just the internet now has a word for that, right? Um, so I think that question about can we have an invasion of, of blonde frat boys and pop calls, that was your question, right? Is this a culturally relative thing? Does it travel? Can it look different other places? But is it still ultimately the same thing, right? So, um, I don't, what do you think? I'm really, I don't know. Like, could you do that? Could you start that meme? I, mean, I think definitely other kinds to the previous question, like, Locke and I were laughing over here because, like, we were saying there's not just one term for insulting someone for <coughs> Shanghai, it's like, probably 20% of online Chinese slang is different types of Swears. exclusionary terms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Which is about the same as us, like, 20% is a good number. Pretty much, like Xbox Live is probably the same. Twenty percent is fact, well, I don't or know, whatever. Like, in in the last panel at RaffleCon, one of the most interesting things that came out was Jamie Wilkinson said something to the effect of, you know, there's traditional internet culture, and you know, you no longer need to have the history to to um, be a part of that. Yeah, but yeah. the thing is that you can't be part of that history unless you're a white man, pretty much. Like, you right. know, it, like that history did not exist for people of color and women until very very recently, and so. This that you need that kind of authenticity to participate in internet culture is kind of crazy to me. But like, well, that's a great question. Like, can you appropriate for progressive purposes a culture which is basically a white male culture? And that's the question of the civil rights movement, right? I mean, there are white people marching with Martin Luther King. You know, Mar Malcolm X died in the arms of a Japanese woman. People kind of forget. So, like, there's definitely ways for that to happen, even if it has its origin in this kind of very exclusionary white male culture. It's happened before, but who's going to do it? <laughs> that's, that's kind of the question about the internet, who's going to do it? Anonymous is not going to do it. I mean, it's pretty clear that that's not going to happen. So um, yeah, you haven't asked a question yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you know, 
Okay, so I don't know if uh, this is sort of getting away from 4chan, uh, this kind of an internet culture. Let's get away from it. Uh, Go ahead. A slightly different one. I don't know if you people read news articles about the Arizona immigration laws, mm -hmm. and then there's all these comments afterwards that people can make. And it, it struck me when you were talking about, um, you know, white people having this idea that racism isn't really a problem anymore, and that in fact, it's not just that. Um, the everyone's equal, it's that white people are now the ones who are underprivileged. And that they're the ones who are right. losing out. Right, right. Because like men. The men's the movement is the same, right? That women have everything. In fact, there's a Harper's Magazine or Atlanta that says women are going to run the world. <laughs> oh, dear <laughs> Lord. <laughs> okay. Worse than I thought. But anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. But, yeah, I mean, I kind of have a, a dual feeling about the. Um, the enlightened racism, I guess. Um, when I was younger, I never really thought about it that much. I ended up working at a um, in a housing development with primarily minorities, and I started to realize that there are jokes you just can't make, and they're not, and they're jokes that white ma people make among themselves in order to po prove that they're not racist. Right. To each other. Can you can you say one though? Oh, well, for example, if you're going through a neighborhood um, where it's a uh, obviously lower income and there are minorities around, oh no, there are, there are black people. Uh, Better lock your doors, guys. Right, uh -huh. that's in line racism, um, exactly. Or and, and often people will do this around other white people who they assume are a little bit racist in order to mock them um, and kind of form a bond with the other people who they assume are less racist in the car. Uh -huh. It's kind of weird. Uh huh. Um, no, but I totally understand what you're talking about, right? So there's yeah. the racism gets talked about offline too, but in very, again, kind of lulzy and complicated ways. But this is a pre preceding the internet, I would say. Sure, it's sure, sure. Similar. Yeah, I think what's what's important to know about internet culture is that it's not separate, right? It's not this other world like we thought in the '90s of cyberspace, you know. <laughs> Um, it is part of the world. I mean, very much RaffleCon was this embodied event where people were looking at the screen and, and following what was going on there, too. So, yeah. yeah. I was wondering if you see any indication that, like, the lulls uh, and this enlightened racism might eat itself. Because you can't question it from the outside because then you, you don't get it. Mm -hmm. But it seems like someone on the inside could question it. Like, mm -hmm. when you were putting up the, uh, the tweets and, like, there was the very uncreative kind of uh, we're going to hijack this with yeah, yeah. the N-word. Yeah. And I would think that someone else in that community is like, well, this is just ridiculous. I yeah. mean, this is just giving us all a bad name. So they would come up with a creative way to attack really kind of the griefers, like griefing right. the griefers. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering if, like, that may be, if there's been any indication of that happening. You had a um, yeah. Oh, you had. You, you both have an answer to it, so why don't you both talk I, about I it? I know that, uh, so with something awful, um, which is uh, another in internet community uh, vaguely somewhat related to 4chan. Um, there's a lot of calling out of members on it, uh, not just as in you did something awful, but in a general, like, these are the kind of people we are. Let's stereotype ourselves and call ourselves out and make fun of ourselves for this thing, for, you know, for who we are as a whole. In the same way that some people are making fun of other groups as a whole, but because it's of the self, it's different or equalizing or something. Well, what I'm wondering is if maybe like the enlightened racism meme is going to become tired, and then they're just going to move on to something, maybe enlightened racism 3.0, or no, like that's... something else entirely. Huh, that's a good question. I mean, I would kind of trace the beginnings of enlightened racism um, to Dave Chappelle, who you may have watched. And, you know, when he explained why he stopped doing his show, it was because he had created a meme, which he saw kind of getting out of control, and which he thought was really bad which was licensing people to talk in a way that he found actually really offensive given the context they were using it in, right? So it let people say things that they ought probably never say, but that he said as a way to mock them. So um, it's a pretty old formation, I think. It'd be interesting to try and see where else it's been. I don't think it's brand new. So will it, get, will it, will it eat itself and give way to something new? Um, probably, but I don't know what that is. Yeah. Right, and you're the researchers who are going to figure that out, because I don't have access to those worlds at my age, right? Um, but I hope that's research people will want to do. I think that's a really important thing to follow up on. Yeah. So I have a 
couple of comments. Uh, first, on Dave Chappelle, there was a really interesting comment I read or heard somewhere, I don't remember where, that he didn't like the fact that black people were laughing at his jokes because they knew how ridiculously untrue they were, whereas white people were laughing at his jokes because they thought it was true. Mm. Uh, but on Christina, what you said about memes or about a production of white people memes, have you seen Tea Party? I was kind of disappointed when I learned it was a Smirnoff uh, thing. Maybe in the future more things like that, but that is probably produced by white males, but at least... It seems like it's still white people laughing at white Yeah. But I think it could be a future. And from uh, Zuckerman's keynote address, yeah, the Muck Monday thing, I think it's just a matter of demographics. Once there are more people across the world on the internet, you'll have things like Muck Monday. That already exists, right? But that yeah. is repeatedly not counted as internet culture. To the point where at Rockwell when I bring up things like jerking videos, no one knows what I'm talking about. Right. right. And like no one recognizes that as part of this culture that we're supposedly talking about, despite the fact that this is also a community that exists primarily online. In that case, it's just a matter of creating an entire other culture that can appreciate it that doesn't even need legitimization or absorption into the mainstream white male generated mm -hmm. meme culture. Again, I think it's a matter of demographics, and it, it'll take a while, but once there's enough of an audience that you don't need the participation of the people who currently are the majority of internet users, or increasingly are no longer the majority, then you'll have people who are not white males producing that culture. But then this is like a, a, a classic you know, debate in the civil rights movement, which is, do we try to assimilate into the majority culture, or do we become our own community and, our, oh, you know, we're striving Linguistically, to... I think um, because of the barriers of language, there will be created independent communities. Just because they don't speak each other's languages, they'll be isolated. But so they already other. exist, right? So in China, there's already an internet culture, yeah. right? So, I mean, what's the point of even having the conversation if those are going to grow up on their own? I mean, in a sense, there isn't. In a sense, so there should be a Rockwell English... on China then, or something. <laughs> in a yeah. sense, yes. I mean, in a sense, there's fears that the English internet could become obsolete. That's absolutely correct. And so all this discourse that we're having in the English language is irrelevant to what the vast majority of the action will be. I mean, there is a future where that's conceivable. Exactly. So then is Christina's worry that, or concern that, you know, there's no one setting the agenda, who, are, who is now setting the agenda, not taking these memes into account? Is that just going to become obsolete? It's not going to matter. It's going to be a moot point anyway because, you know, there It'll won't be drowned be... out by. I, th I think, again, it's a conceivable future. Um, I can't really conceive of another future. I think it's just a matter of, of time. Unless we have an energy crisis and we stop having power to run all the servers. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think what I was trying to get at is that people socialize into this kind of humor, into, into this culture may have a hard time of it in a more transnational world, right? Or in the workplace, or in other situations where this is not the predominant idiom. And so just for that reason, it's probably a good idea to help people see that this is not cool with everyone, right? That enlightened racism is actually just racism for somebody, for me, right? So if you're in, if you're in my class, say, and you write a paper that's just full of this, you're not going to get a good grade from me. That's a kind of instrumental thing to know, right? You're not going to get hired by me to be my RA if you talk this way, right? That's just a practical thing. But there's also a moral ethical thing going on here, right? Which is that the internet was viewed as a way to reset society. It was a reboot button for all the shitty things that were wrong. With our culture, we could kind of reboot it, right, and do something new. And Ralph O'Connor is a great thing because it calls out how that kind of isn't happening, but it kind of is. So it kind of isn't and it kind of is, and that's where we stand now. So how can we shape it a little, right? That was That's the question. Yeah. So to that last point, this type of humor seems to be particularly balkanizing and isolating because a huge part of it is about shutting down surrounding dialogue. Yes. Not right, only yeah. is can you not confront it from the outside because you will just simply be viewed as out of the conversation, but griefing itself is about shutting down conversation spaces. Mm -hmm. You destroy a locality or, you know, you kill the gold farmer and he gets mm -hmm. sent back to a spawn point mm -hmm. and, you know, it's however long before he gets back to where you are and you're probably not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So while I agree with the, yes, we probably should do something about that, this type of activity 
specifically denies doing something about it, it. Right. except from within or at the point in which the practitioner has essentially aged out of the activity itself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's like a lot of things like spray painting stuff. You know, like you age out of that too, and but it doesn't stay around forever, and that's what I'm mm -hmm. concerned about. Is that kids who do this, like it literally is part of an archive that's going to be around forever, and that's not really fair to kids in some ways that they're now kind of going to be known for the time they did this, you know, and they could grow up and learn that that's not cool to do. How else are you going to learn in some ways? So I, I take your point. That's a very good point. Um, so, yeah, I'll just I'll yeah. ruminate on that of adolescent problem. It's not the, the it's not the actor, but it's the persistence of the actor's actions. I don't know if, if I would put adolescence in there. Some of these people are pretty old, you know. But it's a it's a mindset, right? It's true. Um, yeah. Actually, following onto that sort of ambiguity, the the group is called anonymous from Fortune yeah, yeah. and writ large. Those who pursue lulls are anonymous. There's been a lot of language that suggests male gender and white being. Uh, key aspects of the demographics of this group of anonymous, and I'm curious how accurate that is. Taken from the viewpoint of whom has access to the internet, who are the likely participants, I can see that being the construction, but I guess just raising the larger question of what are the demographics of a group that embraces radical anonymity, and how do you know who they even are at any given time? Mm -hmm. And how does this even shape their, their interaction? Can it in some ways be a deconstruction of racism rather than the enlightened racism that you present? I wish. If I could find some way to read it that way, I totally would, right? But I just don't see it. I don't see this as a deconstruction of race, particularly. Does anybody have a reading of it that could possibly kind of try and recuperate it that way? I know the word queer. What would the deconstruction of race uh, like? Well, when you wear queer pride shirt in the 90s and you're gay, yes. right? Queer yes. is the N-word for gay people, or was, and it got recouped, and now it's cool. So maybe that what you're implying, that this could be that? In some ways. If if the constituents, the people who are worried about this polluting in some ways and making them more racist, in, instead of imprint on this as being uh, the real deal on how human beings are, see this as a sort of cannibalistic, horrific, anonymous creation of what society isn't and shouldn't be, and instead imprint on this as being wrong, and this is what you don't write when you want to become an RA. This becomes a deconstruction of sorts of how right, right. seriously some people take this. I think that's a very good point. And Part of what the issue is is that young people can't do that, hmm. right? Like, I think that you and I can do that, right? Because we went to college. But I think that like 15-year-old kids can't do that. They can't figure that out. Like, it's too subtle a distinction to make. And so it's kind of unfair to ask people who don't have those critical tools to enter into a situ like, situation like this and navigate it very successfully, right? So yeah, you're in the very back, yeah. I was curious in terms of like what this enlightened racism and how it impacts structural racism or impact, I mean, or racism on a larger scale, right? If yeah. a young woman was talking about what's um, the comments and the scroll down comments of what's going on in Arizona. And the fact is that, you know, these young, these adolescents don't have the faculties to, you know, to differentiate what is enlightened racism and what isn't enlightened racism. And, and so they, regardless, they may internalize these ideas and what does that mean for us on a larger scale? That's a really big question. Um, I think that irony has become a mode of um, that people retreat into when they don't want to have accountability for a lot of things, right? And it's very hard to have accountability for something like race, which is so heavy. Like, it's just a really heavy, heavy thing. Um, so asking for a return to a culture of sincerity somewhat, right? Taking things more seriously, in a way, um, flies in the face of what people already tend to want to do. So I think that this is racism. And like racism is still racism, right? It's racism under a different guise, but it's still racism, there's no doubt. Um, I think the difference is that what Susan Douglas would say is it's a response to perception of black power or women power, right? It's a response to that and an attempt to kind of tamp it down. So women are a fair game because they make, you know, in some cases more money than men. So let's, let's like, you know, beat them down a little bit because we can now. Whereas before it was just sexism. That was just wrong. You know, that was wrong to do. Um, so her argument is probably more complicated than I'm putting it out here, right? She has an argument kind of based on 
television programming of the 90s and how it evidences this response to the rising power of women, the rising economic power of women, and so on. I don't know if I can say that about African Americans, Latinos, and Asians right now. I don't think it's, it's that, but it, it's some kind of movement which is related, right, which is now licensed to do these things and say these things online as well as offline. So, yeah. I wasn't at RaffleCon, so I don't know the context specifically of these tweets, but is it possible that you are conflating several different phenomena that end up having the same effect and taking a similar form? Like, is this potentially just a particularly unfortunate choice of static that someone is throwing into the feed for, and hmm. should be kept separate from something like griefing in an MMO where it takes a much more graphical and confrontational form? So you're asking, is it possible to read this as not racism? More, not, not necessarily not racism, but more as not intended to be racist, but intended to be static. Intended to be disruptive, huh. but not racist. Right. It's right. just a particularly unfortunate form that it's taking. Actually, yeah, David, please. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great point. It's related to what I wanted to ask. Maybe exactly the same thing. And, um, the games that I, that I play, tag and gay are the choices. Of, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to nigger all that often, mm -hmm, usually, but mm -hmm. usually it's tag and gay. Mm -hmm. And um, I will, you know, I'm 59 years old, I'm a white guy, I, you know, um, I, I'll say something. I almost always do. And the responses are uh, you know, often just completely dismissive. Yeah. But there's sometimes, there's, it seems like the kids, and I'm guessing I'm probably three times older than the next oldest person there. <laughs> <laughs> um, say that it's, they'll be shocked that I'm taking the word seriously. They, right. they don't care about homosexuals. Right. They don't talk about up. homosexuals. It, yeah. they the term has been um, removed in their mind right. from their gay friends. I mean, right. you know, which to me is I, I can't make sense of. But it, I believe so. It, it, they're using it for something other than the term has a terrible effects, etc. Yes. There's no denying that. But it's not quite a simple case of homophobia. Right. Just as it may be that yeah. it, you know, 140 characters, it's really hard to figure out whether it's static. Or it's a, you know. no, there seems to be a definite difference between specifically going out to disenfranchise, you know, Chinese MMO players, whatever their purpose in the game is, and this. The motivations right. seem different. Right. I think you're right. That's totally right. I think that's what makes this unlike racism and not normal racism, is that. Because you're not homophobic, you can say to yourself and to others, I'm not meaning this in a homophobic way, fag, 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 right? That's how you, why and how you can say it. It's because you, are, you, you know and you assume others know that you are not in fact homophobic, right? You have gay friends. I don't know why that's the index of non-homophobia now, but it kind of is. <laughs> it's like I'm black friends. It's like I'm not a racist, right? It's always been that. It's like the evolution of the word jick. It's the same way. It's completely disconnected yeah. from the gypsy reference. Um, right. We just use it every day, and that's the one we see everybody else use. And most people don't realize even the connection when they're saying it. Right. But that's, that's true. A little bit, I mean, this is I mean not sure, that, that may be taking the evolution <laughs> to the next step yeah, even, but it's still in the same progress. It's in the same evolutionary yeah, train. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you. Okay. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make, maybe um, follow up on that and talk about this in terms of the form of play. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if we can say that there is a that that if we understand this in, in, in terms of play, just like playing violent video mm -hmm. games, it's, a, it's about it's about expressing um, something that's been that you're unable to express. And so back to the the idea of, of you know society has, has sort of created an anxiety around around racial discourse in, in any form. And then so we see it online a lot. And so they be, it becomes. It has this power because it's been kind of tamped down yeah, in, in, yeah. in other in other situations. Um, so it, it's this tab, it's taboo, but playing taboo is very fun, you mm -hmm. know. So when we shoot people online, doesn't mean that we actually want to kill people. Right. Um, so maybe there's something like that going on here, where this is a form of play, where there's an established set of rules yeah. that the players know, but the non-players exactly. don't know, and that's part of the rules. Um, and so you know they're. They're playing it, but I, I, I tend to agree that it may be separate from the content. It may be a sort of procedural rhetoric taking place here. Very that... good. I, I agree that Ian Bogo's saying I agree. On the other hand, who gets to decide? 
You know, that's why I talked about Chief Alinawek, right? I don't think my students actually think they're racist at all. They just really love the chief. They have him on their sweatshirt, whatnot. Their mother went to, you know, University of Illinois. They really aren't, they really don't see themselves as racist. But it's not their decision whether they get to have the chief. It's the people who are the Indians who get to decide that, right? So even if you say, fag, 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 I'm not homophobic, that's not really your choice to, to say, now the word means this. It's the people who are gay who get to decide that, it seems to me. And this is part of the problem with reappropriating language is that you can't do it by yourself. You have to have the consent of the people to whom it refers. So the queer movement could be queer because they decided it, they wanted to be queer. They were going to use that term. I don't see people appropriating some of these words that way. And I especially don't see this word appropriated that way. I mean, there's a huge controversy in the black community over whether this word can even be used. I mean, there are a lot of prominent black intellectuals who have said, no, you know, I won't use it. I won't let anyone else use it. There's some famous comedian who went this route. Do you remember who it was? Pardon? Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor. Paul Mooney, but Richard Pryor too, right? It's a kind of rite of passage for a black community. I mean, for a black comedian to use the word, use the word, use the word, and then be like, holy shit, you know, I've been doing it and I'm not going to do it anymore, and then back up from that, right? So it's not like this is new to the internet at all, right? Um, this struggle to reappropriate language has been around for a long time. But again, I don't think you can do it just because you want to do it, right? It has to be a kind of group activity. So, you know, where is it that we can talk about race that's not here? That's an interesting question. Maybe now, right, in the context of school, which this kind of is, or work, um, but is it possible to do it other places? I think that's the problem is that it's not really easy or possible to do other places. You know, could you do it in the hallway after this talk or on the bus talking to someone else? It's difficult to do it. Yeah. Uh, specifically with this instance, it seems like a word that has been appropriated by the black community and then completely walled off from use, you know, especially by white males. And then in that way, once it's you know, incorporated, it becomes radicalized, uh, sorry, radicalized it becomes even more effective as, you know, a distraction, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what is your take on whether, you know, there's, there's any role for it past? I mean, it, it seems to be completely outside of the enlightened racism. So why is it outside of it? Well, in, in the way that um, once, you know, in the example of comedians, it gets moved from, you know, incorporated within the community because it's accepted, because it's been taken mm -hmm. over to move past it is entirely not constructive. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so what is the role between the community and its, its relationship with the other, right? Wow, that's a deep question. Um, and probably a way bigger question that I can probably answer using these examples. I mean, that's several books and a really good, you know, problematic to think through. And I'm not really sure what to say about it. Um, all this to say, though, I think that all social movements have probably had to struggle with this, right? What is their stance going to be? What's the right way? I don't know what is the right way. Um, but I am suspicious of claims that, well, I don't mean it that way, and fuck you if you want me to stop saying it, right? I'm suspicious of that. I don't think that that's a good route to go, right? And that's what Anonymous often is about, that, you know, you can't stop us. You don't know who we are. We're going to say it and say it and say it. Um, there's nothing you can do about it. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, um, one thing that kind of occurred to me, and perhaps it's because the people that are in this room are predominantly white, I don't know, um, but there hasn't been, I feel, a lot of talk about, I mean, people are kind of trying to discuss it from the perspective of the people who, um, who say these things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is a form of play. It is something that people enjoy, it's a lot of fun. There's a pleasure in it. There's a pleasure in saying the word fag. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I get that. But at the same time, I feel like, and this is something I find on the internet a lot, is that like, people don't care at all if what they say hurts someone else um, to the point that like, they probably wouldn't care if the person killed themselves from bullying online. Like, they really just do not care how another person is affected by what they say and do online. And the in, it's the internet and it's not serious, that's, it's a form of communication between people. How can it not be real? I'm, right, 
Right, we're in this building, which is called the Berkman Center for Internet, whatever, right? So obvious it's serious. It's really serious. I mean, there's a whole building for it. I don't know. I mean, it's just... Making sense. Like, the reason not to do it isn't that someone's going to call you out. It's because you're going to hurt somebody. I don't feel like people care about that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, kind of a downer note, but I know we have to leave the room. So, <laughs> thanks for coming to this talk. And. Uh, <laughs>